Hey everyone, welcome to uh, our second online service at New England Bible Church. It's great to have you with us. Um, it was really encouraging for us to hear from many of you after last week's service that uh, you're able to watch it with your families um, and that you felt part of the church family. Um, it was also fun to see some of you posting photos of you all watching it, so please continue to do that. Um, also, do share these videos with those around you as we all need to be reminded of God's promises and his faithfulness to us during this time. Um, one logistical note, so the lyrics to the songs that we'll be singing are uh, in the description below. There's a link to download them, but also if you actually turn on captions, uh, with this YouTube video. You can see the lyrics on the screen while you're watching the video. So hopefully that's helpful. If you're on uh, a phone or a tablet, you should be able to click on the three dots up here uh, and then select captions and turn it on. Uh, if you're on your desktop, uh, you should be able to click the CC icon to turn on captions. Um, so the, hopefully that'll just make it easier for you to sing, sing along with us as we worship together. So with that, let me read from Philippians 4, verses 6 through 8 as our call to worship. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And certainly our God, he embodies all of those things. Uh, so let's turn our hearts and our minds uh, and focus on him this morning and sing these songs in worship and praise to him. Two, three, four. Oh, 
cross, my heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing. Your arms, 
everyone. Good to see you. Welcome to our second online New England Bible Church service. And uh, I'm glad you're here. We got a lot of great feedback from last week. Um, we're glad it worked and that uh, people were able to uh, watch this at home or wherever um, it was convenient for them. And uh, thanks for sending uh, a lot of your feedback and even some pictures. I want to share with you some pictures um, this morning. I got a great picture of uh, Hope. Um, she is uh, playing air guitar along with uh, Dan while he's leading worship, future worship team star there. And then uh, thanks to the Croyles for sending this picture in of uh, their kids, Ben and Grace, who are playing Legos um, while I'm preaching. Uh, not the first time someone has ever been playing with toys while I've been preaching a message. Um, and then I love this picture. Uh, of Griffin Mercier. Uh, Griffin's watching um, Charles teach Sunday school and uh, he's right there in his bed. And then um, I don't have a picture of this one thankfully but I got a great uh, text message um, from Pastor Charles uh, last week. It said, uh, church in bed was fun this morning. Uh, thanks for doing this for us. And I wrote back and I said, you're welcome though this may be a little TMI, too much information. Um, and Charles fired right back and he said, just being biblical, Psalm 149.5. And so you're probably thinking, what does Psalm 149.5 say? And that says, uh, let his faithful people rejoice in this honor and sing for joy on their beds. And so if you're watching uh, church this morning uh, or this afternoon or whenever uh, from your bed, I'm glad you're here. If you're on the couch, uh, wherever, but um, do me a favor, send me a pic. I'd love to see a picture of you, uh, your family, uh, watching the service online this week. So uh, what emotions are you feeling right now? Um, what are the things that are going through your mind as we go through another week of this uh, coronavirus crisis? Um, we've definitely seen I think a little bit of shift in emotions. Early on, there seemed to be just a huge amount of fear, uh, which led to worry, which then created anxiety. And certainly there is still some fear out there for sure, but it seems like there have been more emotions that have um, started to develop this week. Um, a lot of emotion around uh, uncertainty with the economy. Um, obviously, the stock, ma stock market has uh, taken a big hit, but a lot of people now um, are either out of work or their workload has been reduced. Um, and of course now, not only Massachusetts, but uh, residents of New Hampshire are under this new stay-at-home order. And uh, so there's definitely uh, some emotion about that. Um, yet at the same time, uh, while some people, their jobs are in jeopardy, or their hours have been cut back, there are others whose business is booming. Uh, I had a couple conversations this week uh, with a couple different guys who said uh, this is the best that their work uh, has ever been. Uh, work has never been so good and so there are different emotions there. There's also emotions uh, that are resulting from uh, conflicting messages that we're hearing. Um, we have been hearing all along that we need to isolate and quarantine and uh, social distance, wash our hands, uh, just be careful so that we can help to uh, slow the spread and at the same time flatten the curve. Uh, and so uh, we've heard uh, reports that this is working, yet we've also heard reports that, uh, hold on, we're going to see a huge spike or an even uh, peak um, in cases in the next a few days and weeks. And then that's been uh, kind of uh, in conflict with uh, thoughts we've heard this week about maybe we're past the peak. Maybe it's time to reopen the country. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm sure most of you heard the idea of uh, let's get this uh, place open for business by Easter. And of course, I'd love to be here in church with you on Easter morning, uh, but we'll just have to wait and see. But regardless, it's led to a, an emotion uh, of confusion. And then probably one of the biggest emotions that we're uh, fighting right now is just the emotion of cabin fever. And of course we we face this every year um, in New England. Uh, we just want to get out of the house and uh, I think that's even um, a stronger emotion 
now that we have been kind of in the house, not able to go to school or work. And so there's just a lot of cabin fever going on. Uh, but our emotions are often in response to who we are looking to, uh, who we're leaning on during difficult times. And so whoever is in charge, whoever is leading, whoever is making uh, decisions, uh, those are the things which oftentimes dictate our emotions, how we feel. And what an overwhelming task for our leaders uh, to be in right now. I can't imagine being responsible um, for uh, many of the decisions that are being made. Uh, what a huge responsibility. And so we need to remember to pray for our leaders at every level. I don't know if you uh, remember back, it was on February 26, which feels like it was 100 years ago, but it was only a month ago. Uh, but back on February 26, uh, Vice President Pence uh, held what I believe was the first uh, meeting of the newly um, appointed Presidential Coronavirus Task Force. And uh, there's a, there was a picture that was put out, and you probably saw it, um, it was of the meeting, uh, but there was very little information I saw of what was actually discussed at the meeting. The picture was the thing that captured, uh, like, everyone's emotions. And the picture was of uh, Pence, and there's about 15 or 16 people in the room uh, in his office, and they're all sitting around a table. And he starts off the meeting uh, by praying. And you can see everyone in that room has their head bowed, and many have their hands folded, and they're praying. And there were two huge reactions to this picture. Um, some people were just like, oh, we're doomed. Uh, if, the, if the person who's in charge of the response doesn't know what to do, and they're praying to this, this being out there somewhere, we're, we're just doomed. We're in trouble. And then another response, and this is certainly the response that I felt, was um, thank God that we have someone who knows God and acknowledges God during a difficult time. And so this doesn't uh, translate to me as a leader who doesn't know what to do or isn't qualified. I, I think it's the act actually the opposite of that. I'm so thankful that we have a leader who says this task is overwhelming and what better way to start our, our response than to ask God for help. But Pence was not the first one to do that. Um, if you uh, know your Old Testament history, uh, there was a king whose name was Jehoshaphat, and uh, Jehoshaphat was king over Judah. And you can read about this in 2 Chronicles, but there were a band of nations around Judah who all came together and said, we're gonna attack Judah um, and defeat them. And the response was Jehoshaphat, he called the nation to prayer, to fasting, but then he offered this, this verse, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12. It says this. It says, uh, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And I think that is uh, really uh, where a lot of us are right now. We don't know what to do. Uh, we don't know what's coming next. Uh, but our eyes uh, are on God. And so I hope that's true for you. Are you depending on God? Are you leaning on him uh, during this time? Uh, the Bible is full of thousands of promises. And um, I want to share, share some of those with you. Uh, but first, I want to look at uh, three quick situations. Um, and you're probably familiar with all of them. Uh, Abraham. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, uh, God went to Abraham. His name then was still Abram. Uh, but he said to, to Abram, he said, I'm going to give you a great nation. Now that's a big promise, but it was even bigger when it was made because at the time, um, Abram and Sarah, they, they didn't have any children. And God said, I'm going to make you a great nation. Uh, you're going to have many descendants. And you're going to have land that this nation can call uh, its own. And we saw that this promise was fulfilled. Abraham and Sarah were able to have um, children, and these children, uh, they produced many, many descendants, and those descendants did become 
uh, a nation, and that nation eventually uh, inherited the promised land. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 9, uh, God said, If you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne. And we know that that came true for Solomon. Uh, God told him that uh, he would become king someday, and he did. And then in the New Testament, we have Mary, the mother of Jesus. And you prob probably remember, remember when Mary and Joseph, they took Jesus to the temple. And while there, uh, this prayer, but really this promise was given to Mary, where she was told that this child would be destined to cause the falling and rising of many. And then the promise went on to say this, a sword will pierce your own heart also. And of course, we know that that uh, came true. Mary was there uh, at the cross when her son was crucified. And Joshua records, not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Not one. Every one of them was fulfilled. Numbers chapter 23, we read this, God is not human that he should lie. He's not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? And so our Bibles are full of promises that God has made. But not only are they, are they full of promises, but we can also read of many of the promises which have been fulfilled. God has kept his word. And he has shown us that we can trust him, we can believe in him, we can depend on him. And so I want to speak for a few minutes this morning, or whatever time it is you're watching this, about the promises that God has made to us that we can hold on to during these times of uncertainty. And so I want to share with you uh, five areas um, where God has made very specific promises. And the first is this, God knows you. That's a promise. And if you have your Bibles, uh, I encourage you to turn to the book of Isaiah. In fact, we're gonna look at a couple of promises that God made uh, in the book of Isaiah. But in Isaiah chapter 43, we read this. Uh, but now, thus says the Lord who created you, uh, fear not, I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name, you are mine. And so one of the great promises that God makes to us is that he knows us, he knows who we are, and he knows our name. So have you ever run into somebody and it's like out of context, it's it's someone that you know that you know, but you can't remember like where you know them from or how you know them, and you're kind of looking at them, and, and then you're like, oh, I don't wanna run into them and like actually have to say something because then they're gonna figure out that I can't remember their name. And so you're, hey, brother, hey, buddy, um, good to see you, man, um, which is code for good to see you, but I have no idea what your name is. Um, and of course, that can be embarrassing and I know that's happened to all of us, but God never looks at us and doesn't know our name. He knows our name. God knows your name. He knows who you are. And it's not just that God knows you, but God also promises that he will be present with you. Go back a chapter to chapter 41, Isaiah chapter 41. And look down in verse 10. Many of you uh, know this verse. A lot of you have this memorized. Uh, Isaiah 41, verse 10, it says this, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And so right off the bat there, the Lord says, uh, don't be afraid. Why? Because I'm with you. Don't be dismayed. Don't be discouraged. Why? Because I am your God. We read a similar verse in the 23rd Psalm, uh, 
Uh, very popular, of course. But you remember the phrase, uh, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. God promises that he will be with us, that he will be present. Remember, at the end of Moses' life, and we know that um, right before he died, he was able to um, address, uh, talk with Joshua and, and speak to the nation. And he gave this famous verse where he said, the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And that promise was true, not just for the children of Israel, but all the way through uh, to now. We see this uh, repeated again in the book of Hebrews. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Joshua repeated this again. Be strong and courageous. Uh, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And Christ himself repeated the same promise. He said at the very end of the book of Matthew, um, he said, Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. And so God promises his presence. But he doesn't just promise that he will be with us. He goes beyond that and he promises that he will protect us. Look back at chapter 43 in Isaiah. Those first few verses, I'll, I'll read them again. He says, but now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, you are mine. And so that's his presence. Now look at the next verse in verse two. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You know, it's, it's interesting because I think there's a part of all of us that wants to be told uh, there's not going to be any problems. Uh, you're not going to have any issues. In fact, a lot of us kind of hope that, um, hope that, that, that that's something that comes as a result of our faith. In fact, some people even twist this into a false faith, into a false gospel. And they say, if you just come to Jesus, if you just put your faith in Christ, everything will be fine. And you'll have uh, lots of prosperity and you'll have no issues at all. The scripture actually says it's the opposite of that. Psalm 20 says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but it is the Lord who delivers him out of them all. There's actually two promises in that verse. The first is, the righteous, those are the people who follow Christ, it says many are their afflictions. Now scripture never exaggerates. We tend to exaggerate, but scripture never does. So when scripture says, afflictions are going to be many, I think that's more than two or three. And so when it says there, when you pass through the waters, when you go through the rivers, when you walk through the fire, that sounds like there's going to be many types of afflictions. So this, this virus, this has like affected everything. The whole world has changed because of this thing called coronavirus. The economy, education, entertainment, whatever we call normal, everything is now this new normal. And it not only has changed, but it's continuing to change. And for many of us, uh, we are going through deep waters. We're certainly going through uncharted territory. But the promise here is, when you go through the waters, God will be with you. Again, the promise is, um, when you go through this, there's no exemption. There's, there's, there's no uh, set of parentheses here that say, uh, when you go through the waters, except for, and then put your name in there. No, it's 
when you, when I, when we go through difficult times, God promises that he will be with us. When you go through the rivers, they will not overflow you. So the imagery there, imagery there is this. Walking through a river, the water represents something which could hurt us. It actually doesn't say there that the water will be stopped. Now we know that God could stop it. We know that God has stopped it. In fact, go back again to the Old Testament. What did God do with the Red Sea and the Jordan River? Both of those times the waters were stopped or spread and the people were able to walk through on dry ground. But that's not the promise that's given here. The promise that's given here says when you go through the rivers, a.k.a. a difficult situation, they will not overflow you. Well, that language then makes me wonder if that doesn't mean that we might get a little bit wet. We might feel uh, some of these waters. We might feel uh, some of this danger. But God's promise is, even if it comes to your ankles or to your knees or to your waist, I don't know how far it's going to go. He just says, it won't overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. So God not only promises his protection, but God also promises his provision. You remember the words that we studied last week? In fact, we, we refer to these quite often. Christ, when he was giving his famous Sermon on the Mount, and when it was recorded in the book of Matthew, you can look back and read that. But in chapter 6, Jesus said this. He said, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they are? It's a rhetorical question, but the, the answer is known. And Christ is saying, aren't you more valuable than a bird? He's not saying the bird doesn't have any value. No, he's saying the bird does have value, has so much value that God himself is aware of all of the actions of a bird. He said, even if a bird falls to the ground, our God knows about it. But how much more valuable are you? I like what the psalmist says in Psalm 145, verse 15 and 16. It says, the eyes of all look to you, and you, God, give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The imagery there is powerful because it says you open your hand. Kind of the, some, of the, some of the same language that Isaiah used about upholding us with his mighty right hand. So how big is God's hand? Well, it must be big enough to hold up everyone who is looking to him. It tells us that God holds the oceans of the earth in the palm of his hand. So how big would your hand have to be to hold the oceans? And it said it's from God's hand that he satisfies every living thing. The Apostle Paul, who knew what it meant to depend on God in times of need, said this, he said, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So let's not get this verse wrong. It doesn't say that God will supply all of your wants. What Paul said was, God will supply all of your needs. You know, we know that's true even today. So we've kind of had this a little bit of a, I don't want to say frustration, but maybe a dilemma here at the church. Um, we have done our best to reach out uh, to all of you, uh, some through very uh, general messages and updates, um, and some through uh, very uh, personal phone calls and emails and texts. But we've tried to reach out to those in our congregation uh, who are vulnerable in some way. And we've just thrown out the, the offer, can we help? And um, while we've been doing that, we've also had people calling the church saying, 
Um, if, if anybody needs anything, we're here. We can drive, we can pick stuff up, we can run errands. Um, we'll just do whatever, just tell us. And this dilemma that we're in is, is that we have all these people who have offered to help and virtually no one has said we need anything yet. Now I think some of that is because most of us aren't good at asking for help. And so let me just say, if you need help with something, uh, please ask, don't be embarrassed. Um, shoot us an email, call the church office, um, just ask, we're, we're here. Um, we have a great fund uh, that we've had in place for years called our PIN Fund, our People in Need. And uh, that fund has been getting bigger and bigger over the last few months bef before we even knew about this whole situation. And um, our deacons are ready to, to help with this, uh, but we just haven't had anybody really ask for it yet. And so if, if you're in a tough time right now, uh, please uh, ask and we want to help you. But at the same time, I think that this has also shown to us that God has been supplying all of our needs. I reached out to one of our families. I knew that their jobs were in jeopardy. And I, I said, uh, hey, the church is here. We want to help in any way we can. Um, and uh, this man responded and he said, you wouldn't believe the way that God has been answering our needs uh, during this time. And so even now we're seeing this promise fulfilled that God is supplying all of our needs. And so the last thing that I want to share with you is that God uh, promises peace. God promises peace. In fact, Jesus himself said in John 14, he said, peace I leave with you. So what is peace? Sometimes we define peace as the absence of war. But that's not really the full definition of it because you can be free from war but still not have peace. But Christ said, I want to give you peace. And he said, I don't give to you as the world gives to you. So Christ was talking about something different than whatever the earthly understanding of peace is. And the way he described it, he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. I think peace has more to do with our hearts than with our hands. I think peace has to do more with what's on the inside than what's on the outside. I think peace is more about our spiritual condition than our physical condition. Jesus went on to say, he said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And so that's a verse that's very similar to that verse we just looked at in Psalm chapter 20. He said, in this world you will have trouble. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So who are you depending on during these times of uncertainty, these times of cabin fever? As we move forward in these next few weeks, I know that we have at least one more service that's online, and it feels like at the rate we're going, it's gonna be even more than that, but all that will be figured out. But I do know this, whether we're meeting uh, this way online or whether we're back here in our sanctuary face to face, over these next few weeks, we're gonna start talking more and more about the theme of Easter. Why did Christ come? Why did he die? Uh, what does it mean to us that he resurrected? Uh, how does that matter to us today? And all of that uh, matters big time. And it all applies to these current troubles and times of uncertainty that we are in. And so we'll continue with this theme uh, next time. But I just want to close our time together. I'd love to pray with you uh, before we're done. So will you pray with me? Uh, God, thank you for our church. Uh, we're all in different places today. Uh, but thank you for um, the gift of technology, which allows us to be together. 
And so whether we're on our couch or our lazy boy or in bed or sitting out on the back deck, thank you that we are together and uh, we're still able to worship. We're still able to um, study your word together. Thank you that your promises are true. Thank you that we can depend on them. Uh, thank you that we can lean on them during these difficult times. And so I pray for our church family today. I pray for um, physical protection, for provision. We uh, are so thankful for your presence during uh, this time. I pray especially for those uh, who have loved ones who have been affected by this virus. We pray for their healing. We pray for those who have been impacted by uh, the economy, uh, businesses closing down. We pray that you would supply their needs during these uh, next few weeks. And we pray that um, you would give us the strength to lean on you, uh, even when um, it's easy to get to a place of fear and worry. And so you are good, we can trust in you. And uh, I thank you that we can share this time together today, online. And we pray these things in the good name of Jesus, amen. God is good all the time, amen. So as we go into the coming week, uh, let's carry with us God's promises and be reminded of his faithfulness day by day. And surely as we look upon history from creation through the death, life, resurrection of Christ uh, till today, we can be confident that he will be faithful forevermore. Amen. Let's sing together. Two, three, four. darkness we were away without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt His name in his free. 
Thank you again for watching this online presentation from New England Bible Church. We're glad that you joined us, even though we can't be in fellowship in this building today. We also wanted to let you know that we have a lot of ministry opportunities for our church, even in these difficult times. We're especially excited to help the families of New England Bible Church. For example, if you have a student in middle school or high school, they can continue to be involved in our student ministries. We're offering youth groups still on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. and Sunday school on Sunday mornings, even today at 10.30 a.m. The way we're doing it is through the Zoom app. You can find the meeting ID for this morning's meeting and our Wednesday night meetings in the description for this video. Also, if you have a child who's younger than youth group age, we are continuing to find ways to serve you and continue our children's ministry. Our children's ministry director, Adrian Lehman, is sending home to your house these forms each week where you can continue to use our Sunday school curriculum, the Gospel Project, at your house. We hope we can find even more ways to help your family during this time, and we ask that you please let us know the best ways that we can care for you. Like Pastor Charles said, we would love to hear how we can continue to support you during the coronavirus pandemic. We have many people who have already stepped up to help, and we at the church, the pastoral staff, are waiting to hear from anybody who might need anything. So definitely don't hesitate to reach out. Additionally, we want to let everyone know that we have online giving for NEBC, both to support the daily operations of the church our missions fund, as well as our PIN fund. That is the fund that we utilize when we support people who are in need. We thank you again for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you soon. God bless.